The word meek has an interesting definition. It actually means power under control. A lot of times we think meek might mean weak, something to that effect. It means power under control. Of course, a king uh, is endued with all of the power necessary to rule his kingdom. But in the case of God Almighty, it's unlimited power. He is the creator of the universe. He had enough power to do anything, and yet he comes humbly, meekly, that power being controlled for the purpose of addressing the need in the lives of those who are subject to his kingship. One translation or a couple actually use the word gentle. Jesus is a gentle king, a loving king that extends his power to his constituency uh, in order to address need that exists in their lives. And so we see that we need to first of all know him indeed is our king. Put the cloak of our lives before him. Submit everything that we are. Surrender our will to him as our king. And he is a victorious king, able to impart to you a victory over the touch of death and hell as it comes to you in any arena of your life. And a gentle, loving king that is always there to address your need at any point in time. We need to know him this way, as king. But the Bible goes on to say that it's not enough now just to know him as king. There is another revelation of how he wants us to know him that's hugely important to each of us and that we need to spend a little time uh, looking into. Now, I've actually taught from this passage of Scripture a few months ago, so if you were in that service, you probably are going to get your mind renewed, which is a good thing. But let's turn to Psalm 23 for just a moment. Psalm 23, and uh, there's another aspect to his kingship that he that he extends to us, or I should say progression from our knowing him as king. In verse 1 of Psalm 23, we read simply, <clears throat> the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord, of course, <clears throat> excuse me, is a reference to your having made him the final authority in your life, your king. So this is for someone who can say, he is my Lord. And of course, the process of being able to say that begins with your decision to surrender your will, your life to his kingship. But he says once that occurs, then he is also to be known as your shepherd. That means someone who protects and guides, someone who nurtures and takes care of the flock. The analogy is used throughout the word. And of course, nowhere more than in the New Testament and the New Covenant, we are told repetitively over and over again that, you know, in a variety of ways, uh, Jesus is referred to as our chief shepherd, the chief shepherd. And of course, you know, uh, we need to know him as our shepherd. So I think it's beneficial for us to Consider the passages of, of Scripture that will tell us how we enable him to be our shepherd. It begins with his lordship. Nothing we read in Psalm 23 is going to apply unless he indeed is your Lord. But then you need to come to know him also as your shepherd. And if you do, the result is simple. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I love the passion translation of this verse. It says, the Lord is my shepherd and my friend. I always have more than enough. 
When you have no want, then you have more than enough. Anything that comes in after that, after all of your wants, your needs, and then your wants are addressed, you have more than enough. And so that's the, the fruit of learning to know him as your shepherd. You'll always have more than enough. Now, don't get aggravated with me. If you've heard a, a, you know, a religious reading that would suggest that's not the case, we need to uh, get away from the wants and just serve him. True, we do, no matter what our condition in life. But if you're going to follow his lead and he's going to be your shepherd, then you will discover that you always have more than enough. The balance of Psalm 23 is a snapshot of the progression to that place. It ends up in verse 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Doesn't matter if there's a coronavirus going on, some other plague, some other hardship, some other difficulty. You can come to a place where surely goodness and mercy are going to follow you all the days of your life. This is the end result of knowing him not only as your king and bowing your life before him and celebrating the truth of his coming, but knowing him as your shepherd. And the progression we see culminates in that truth, goodness and mercy, following you all the days of your life. So let's look at verse 2. The first thing that he is going to see to it, lead you to, bring you to a conclusion that is necessary, is making you to lie down in green pastures. And the, you know, the terminology that is used here is interesting to me. Uh, because God's not going to override your free moral agency and make you lie down. So I think uh, the understanding we need to have of this, uh, this verbiage, the way this is expressed, is that he is going to always be there for you as it gets darker and harder throughout the days of your life and you get busier and more confused. You're going to come to a point where you have to lie down, you have to rest. And so he says that he will uh, see to it that you lie down in green pastures, which means it's a comfortable place, it's a blessed place, and it's a place where nurture can be found. Nurture for a flock meant green grass. And of course, the, the analogy for us is there's gonna be a time perhaps multiple times during the course of a believer's life when you, you begin getting too busy in what you're doing and your life gets more frustrating and confusing with every day until you come to a place where you have to rest. And then the Lord will see to it that that rest is supernatural in its origin and it'll bring nurture to your life lying down in green pastures. Not so much a physical place, although, you know, there are places that I think every believer has uh, that are especially restful. You know, Hebrews says this is not going to be an easy thing. You're going to have to get out from under the cares and the anxiety, the worry, the fear that is always the result uh, of a life that is pressing forward in its own strength, you're going to have to get out from under that. And there's a, a restful place. Maybe for you, depending on your personality and your likes and dislikes, it might be in a fishing boat somewhere, on a quiet lake. It could be in a tree, uh, in a tree stand somewhere out in the woods. I, I, love, I love that environment. Uh, you know, creation is all around you. Wildlife is all around you. Uh, you get really rested. You can, get, you can let down and begin getting the benefit of what God is speaking to you in that kind of environment. And so lying down in green pastures and experiencing a rest that will begin the process of rejuvenation. It's better if you come to this conclusion on your own 
Read the word, know you're gonna have to give yourself times of rest. That's what the Sabbath was all about. You know, making yourself cease from your own labor, your own effort, working to solve your problems in your own strength, being inundated by all of the confusion and the many voices that are in this world, finding a place of rest. If you know this is something you need to do, you can be proactive in planning time away. Each day, each week, you'll know when you need it. But I would start out each day lying down, resting, receiving from him. And then he says, after you've rested and rejuvenation has begun, now you can get up and begin movement. He says that he's going to lead you. But now he's going to lead you by still waters. When you've been resting, it doesn't matter if it's a raging torrent. It doesn't matter if the storm is blowing. It's going to seem like still waters to you because you've begun receiving nurture from him in this place of rest. Now he can begin leading you. You can get back uh, into the things that you need to do in this life, but it's going to be like there's still waters. This is analogous to the peace that we see in the new covenant referred to as a peace that passes all understanding because the circumstance can be anything but peaceful, yet you've got that peace garrisoning about your heart and mind in Christ Jesus even as God leads you through your day. So we see the progression from rest and then the process of, of uh, refreshing beginning and then movement through your day and into your life. It's going to be like still waters because the peace of God is garrisoning about your heart and mind. And it's this rest and this peace, as in verse 3 we see, will begin the process of restoring your soul. No, actually it consummates the process of restoring your soul. It says, now he restores <coughs> your soul. And your soul has to be restored before you can be useful to yourself or to God. Remember, we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. Your soul determines which controls the direction your life takes. Your spirit, the real you, or the direction that your shepherd brings you in that manner? Or is it gonna come from the world around you and direct your physical uh, activity based on physical demands? It's your soul that decides that. Your soul is where your free moral agency resides. Your soul is a three-part consideration as well. The mind, your free moral agency called your will, and your emotions. And your will is always activated in a way that reflects the interaction between what you're thinking and how you're feeling. What you're thinking and how you're feeling produces a decision. And so if your soul isn't restored by the rest and the peace that is a progression to a restored soul, then you're likely to be making wrong decisions for death and cursing instead of life and blessing. But now that your soul is restored, he can lead you in paths of righteousness. Now you're making right decisions and he can lead you the right way, right behavior. And this isn't a matter of screwing up your willpower and trying to change your behavior legalistically. It'll flow out of a restored soul that your shepherd has brought you to this place and now he can lead you in paths of righteousness things that are going to produce the blessing that he wants you to have. And it says, for his name's sake, that he wants people to see through you because people are going to draw conclusions about you, about God, rather, through you. And so it's for his name's sake, for his sake, as well as he loves you and he wants you blessed but he wants your behavior to reflect his truth so people can see him through you. 
That's why the Bible says your life is a written epistle. So we see the progression. Going from rest, now movement uh, in your life by still waters, the peace of God garrisoning you about. The restored soul is the result. Your mind and your emotions have been restored and will interact properly to produce good decisions and now God can begin leading you rightly in this life and people will see him through you. Now you're prepared for the valley of the shadow of death and nobody wants to talk about that but it's life on this earth. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And he doesn't say if, you will. As Jesus said, there is tribulation in this world. It is already there. There's a lot of evil out there doing war with good, with light. And of course, you're gonna walk through valleys, it should be plural, of the shadow of death throughout your tenure on this earth in your physical body. But he said, if you've gone through this process consummating with the restoration of your soul and your life behavior is reflecting God to all who would see, now you're prepared to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. Because you're mindful always of the fact that thou art with me. I'm not going to get sidetracked by discussing the danger, the poison that fear is. Just briefly, fear operates on the same principle faith does. A man is as he thinketh or believes in his heart. If you're believing all of the negative circumstance that's out there, it'll produce fear. That's what you're believing. And your believing will take you toward what you don't want to go toward. Fear's deadly. So you can't have fear in your life. And he said you can walk through the valley of the shadow if you are conscious that God is with you. The same one that led you to the resting place, that led you by the still waters, that restored your soul, that changed your lifestyle. And your lifestyle now speaks volumes about God to others. The same God is with you in the valley of the shadow of death. So you have no need to fear any evil that might come against you. And you'll be reminded that his rod and his staff will comfort you right in the middle of that valley. You can gain comfort from knowing that God is with you. And his rod will provide the protection you need. His staff also and the direction that you need to go in the midst of that darkness. And you'll know that. So you'll fear no evil. That's the only way to go through the valley of the shadow. And right in the middle of the biggest battle in the next verse, verse 5. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Some translations say, when your enemy attacks. Right when the attack is on. He's prepared a table for you. All you got to do is take a seat at the table. Don't bail out before you take a seat at the table and say, oh me, oh my. My enemies are attacking right now. He's prepared a table. It's there. Just open your eyes. Take a look. A table represents three things. It represents nurture, nourishment, of course. And just as surely as there's nourishment for your physical body, there's nourishment for your spiritual man. That is the Word of God. There's nourishment there. There's fellowship there. And the implication is fellowship with God. A joining of hearts with your shepherd, with your Lord, with the creator of this universe. Right there, there's a table. There's an opportunity. But I think a lot of people miss it, but not realizing 
that oftentimes the table of fellowship he's prepared is with a person. A person that's filled with him, filled with his spirit, that he can express himself through to you. You'll find when the enemy's attacking, God will open the door to opportunities for fellowship with people that he can speak through, that he can minister life to you through. You've got to know that table is prepared for you and be looking for it. It's there. And it's there that you can receive spiritual nourishment to bring you out of the battle that you're facing as a victor. It's there that you'll know the presence of God in a special way, even though it may be through another person that he's prepared for that table to minister to you through. It could be a time when you simply are in fellowship with the Almighty. In one of these quiet times, he'll come to the table with you. His presence manifests to you. But don't forget the possibility or even probability that he'll use another person and his indwelling presence in them to minister to you through. That table is there when your enemies attack. And it'll do marvelous things for you. It goes on to say, your cup's going to run over. Right in the middle of the attack, man, that anointing and that power of God is going to begin to fill you up Thou anointest my head with oil. That is a type of the Holy Spirit and that endowment of power within you because of his presence is going to begin running over. It's going to begin running out and changing the shape of that attack you're under right now and beginning to manipulate the outcome of the battle so that the victory is yours. Actually, it's his, but it's his through you your victory. And it says it's going to overflow. My cup runneth over. That means when you're in this place, this is a time to shine. View the battles. View the attacks. View the valley of the shadow. View that onslaught of the enemy as an opportunity to shine, my friend, because God will turn it around. You find that table of fellowship And you're going to find your cup running over with the anointing, the empowerment of God. You're going to get excited. You're going to see uh, ways that he's made where there was no way. You're going to be reinforced by his very presence in your life. And it's going to affect other people around you. Those that you're in, in fellowship with, in the natural that have got their own battles going. Maybe there are people you're joined with in your workplace or in your church or in your family. When your cup starts running over with the empowerment of God and the enabling ability of God, guess who's going to get affected by that? Anybody that's close to you, anybody that's nearby, they're going to be affected by that same overcoming Power that enablement of God that is your cup running over. You're going to win that battle and breeze through that valley. And fear doesn't have to touch you one moment while you're in the midst of it. And then he says, now he says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That includes coronavirus days. That includes every day you will experience. If he is your shepherd, if you know him as your shepherd, not only your king, but you know him as your shepherd, then surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Wow. So we can understand the importance of knowing him as he says he wants to be known. Yes, it's good to know about God, gain facts and natural understanding about who he is and what he says. But there has to come a place when he becomes your king. You know him as king. 
You've prostrated your life before him. You have surrendered your will to him. And you begin to receive him, not only as the final authority in your life, but you need to receive the victory over death and hell that he brings to you. You need to receive his gentle lovingness through which he will exercise his power to change your life. And then once he is your king and Lord, now he wants you to know him as shepherd. Put a premium on rest and let rest take you into peace, a restored soul, paths of righteousness. When the hard places come and the valley shows up, you don't have to fear a thing. His rod and his staff are there to comfort you. And there's a table somewhere in the middle of all of this, right at the peak of the attack that he's prepared for you, that you can come to and receive the nourishment and strengthening you might need, receive the love, the fellowship, the assurance that is needed during these times, and your cup will start running over with the power of the Holy Ghost, the anointing of the Almighty and you'll begin to experience the fruit of his being the shepherd in your life, knowing him as the shepherd. Thank you for joining us for today's broadcast. If you're looking for a way to connect with our ministry further, you can find us on social media. We strive to bring encouragement to our followers with each week that passes. Before we go, I want to wish the ladies a happy Mother's Day. There is nothing like the unconditional love of a mother, and today we celebrate you. Join us again soon for our next broadcast, and until then, remember, God wants you to be a winner in every area of life.